Manx Radio Sport. Good evening and welcome once more to Friday Sport Preview on Manx Radio. I'm Rob Pritchard, here with you until 6.30pm to take a look at the sporting action to come over the next few days. So, coming up tonight... The curtain raiser ahead of the new Manx football season takes place tomorrow as Peel and Corinthians are set to battle it out for the Eric Fletcher Charity Shield. It's now less than 48 hours until the start of the 2023 Manx Grand Prix in the race's centenary year. We hear from some of the local riders on their ambitions. And with MGP having plenty of talking points off the track, we also get the views of both the supporters and the organisers. That is all to come this evening. Well, before we dive into the important matter of the 2023 Manx Grand Prix getting underway on Sunday, a day before that will will be silverware up for grabs ahead of the start of the new Manx football season. Last season's Canada Life Men's Premier League Champions Peel will face off against ECAP FA Cup winners Corinthians at the Bowl tomorrow at 1.45pm for the Eric Fletcher Charity Shield. So, after another summer of change before then, how are both sides being rated on their chances on taking this first trophy before the new campaign? Well, taking a look at this weekend and more is our very own Tony Meppham, starting with a look at Peel. It's going to be interesting just to see how strong their squad is, uh, because from what I'm hearing, there's not too many players gone there, but they had a, a strong contingent. How many of them start to go to university? That's always a big question. So it's all been a little bit uh, secret, but... No doubt about it, Dan Bell and Mark Kelly, the management team there, had a great team last year. Uh, They got to uh, a cup final as well, so it's just one of those. They've just got to develop these young players and hopefully they'll progress and uh, give them the league and give them the charity shield that they're after on Saturday. And Peel as well, yes, they won the league, but lost out to Corinthians, of course, in the um, the ECAP FA Cup final. That's why Corinthians coming up against them. So maybe a bit of chance at revenge here for the Western side? Um, I would say so, but I think uh, when you look at uh, Corinthians, I'm the chairman of Corinthians, and um, I think it's going to be a tough old season uh, for the boys, but there's a lot of good young players coming through, um, so that's uh, something that we're just going to have to watch and see. A couple of them played last year and looked really good, and uh, you know Nathan Robinson, who's been sort of waiting, champing at the bit to turn 16, uh, his first game playing in a white shirt, and he, he, he sleeps and breathes Corinthians. He scored against FC Alaman, so that'll live in his memory for a long, long time, so it, it bodes well for a great game, um, just to keep people posted. it's The reason why we've gone for this week is because FC Isle of Man have got no game. And also uh, the main one is that uh, there's no extra time, so after 90, if it's all square, we move into uh, straight into a penalty shootout. So it should be interesting. And just going back to Peel, just very briefly for a second there, you, you mentioned that the squad is largely consistent as it stands at the moment with uh, their title-winning side from, from last season. We do see a bit of a merry-go-round every so often, with clubs everywhere, the Isle of Man's no exception. So the fact that Peel have been able to keep a consistent squad base, uh, how well does that bode going into the next campaign? Well, I think it's important. Um, you know, I'm looking at uh, Laxey. Laxey last season, superb towards the end. Uh, they won that Hospital Cup. And when you look at uh, sort of the young players they've got th- coming through the Laxey system, you say, wow, this is a team for the future. Uh, but they've uh, been cute in the signings this year. They've signed basically five Island international players for them so then that leaves five sort of uh, players who probably thought that they'd be in that team having to work harder now to get in that starting lineup. so it is a bit of a merry-go-round bit of concern about uh, St George's at the moment um, just to see where we are with them because uh, they're still struggling a little bit so hang in there boys hopefully it'll come good for you uh, but it, when it comes to the league I know this is the cup uh, you've got to look at uh, sort of Peel, Russian. Um, I think one or two players will come back into that team for them from FC Isle of Man. Uh, so it's going to be a right good battle and uh, discussion coming towards the end of the month, Rob, of possibly changing the league format. Uh, we've just left it with the clubs at the moment, have a little chat amongst themselves, and then every single club will be asked to put forward their club's thoughts before uh, we make any rash decisions to maybe look at this for the future of Manx football. We want the clubs to discuss it first. Of course, we spoke about that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, details on that over at manxradio.com as well. And just finally, looking generally at the um, Eric Fletcher Charity Shield, we are still in the midst of pre-season officially as well. But when you've got silverware up for grabs and pre-season campaigns are underway ahead of the ahead of the new season, um, how much of a boost mentally can winning a piece of silverware like this have going into a new season? Well, I think it's just uh, like the bragging rights, isn't it? A team wins and uh, you know they're all for it and the team loses and think, oh, we're, how are we going to do this season? But I think um, at the moment, 
Rob, and I know I'm president of the Isle of Man FA, there seems to be a little bit of buzz out there uh, with clubs because uh, some have trained, started training early. There's a lot of friendlies uh, going on. Yes, there's some teams out there struggling for numbers, but it's that sort of thing at the moment, the reason why they didn't vote for the start of the season now, if you like. we I wanted to start it uh, tomorrow, uh, but the club said no. A lot of people are away. And uh, there's good numbers kicking around. So it's great to see. But those clubs out there that are struggling a little bit for players, you know, just uh, hang in there. And hopefully the players will sort of look at it and think, well, I'm going to come back. I'm going to play. Why not go to a club where I can help them out? And the referees thing as well, Rob. Yeah, we're still in a bit of a panic mode on that one. Uh, But there were five referees who uh, did the course last week. Uh, Two of them are ex-footballers. So that's an advancement. They move very quickly into the system of that. But anybody out there who's thinking about it thought, I missed that course, get in touch with the Isle of Man FA. We'll go again. We'll put courses on for two, three or whatever. There's one or two uh, referees who've come back in as well, but we are still light on numbers, so we need some more for the black uniform. Well, let's move on now to things Manx Grand Prix, and there's less than 48 hours to go now before the races return in what is a very big year for the event. 2023 marks the 100th year of the Manx Grand Prix, with a series of different events taking place around the race and qualifying schedule to recognise this important milestone. Well, in the last couple of weeks, we've been catching up with some of the local riders, as well as those representing supporters and organisers to get their thoughts. Well, first up, we hear from a local rider who'll be making a much welcome return to the Snaefell Mountain course, Nathan Harrison. The Onken man missed this year's TT and Southern 100 due to injury but we'll be back out on the bike again on Manx soil next week after getting back up to speed and fitness in recent weeks so how's he feeling about making his mountain course comeback I caught up with Nathan this week yeah I can't wait obviously the TT course is what I live and breathe I started racing to race around the TT course and I was absolutely gutted to miss out on the TT from my Northwest 200 crash but there was a lot of things going on in my life around that time as well so I think personally looking back now I think everything was meant to happen for a reason I was trying my hardest to do the TT and my dad and Javier the Honda Racing UK boss were like you're not doing it basically as a soft blow um but looking back now I could see fully why they said that and I wouldn't have been fit I probably wouldn't have done myself justice and then obviously everything that was going on at home it just wasn't right but we spent the last few months getting back up to fitness, back in the gym, uh, being going away, doing some track days. I was racing at Fruxton at the British Championship last weekend. I'm feeling strong and I can't wait to get going again. And of course, an, uh, an exciting time in terms of the uh, machine you're going to be riding as well. You're going to be deputising for Lee Johnston this year as he recovers from injury uh, on board his Ashcourt Racing Honda. So how did that come about? How exciting was that? Yeah, uh, firstly, I'm, I, I am gutted that Lee can't ride um, for the Manx Grand Prix. I know how much he loves that RC45, but hopefully I can do it some justice. But yeah, um, obviously Lee had an accident at the Northwest 200 as well. Um, he was a little bit worse off than I was. So a week after the TT or so, I got a phone call from Lee and he basically said, you're obviously contracted to Honda and everything else. You've had a rough time and would you like to come and ride our RC45 for the Ashcourt team? And I didn't even think about what I said. I just snatched his hand off and said I'd absolutely love to. Um, we've been testing that at Cadwell Park last week as well. Did Monday and Tuesday there, and it's an unreal bit of kit. The Ashcourt guys have put in some effort into it. Um, everything is brand new. Compared to when Lee wrote it last year, they've put a lot more time and effort because they've had more time. They've developed it. So I've got like a little joke with Lee saying I'm just developing it for him for next year, but... No, I'm really looking forward to it. It's an iconic machine. Um, the likes of Joey Dunlop, Steve Hislop, Phil McCallan, all them names have ruined an RC45 on the TT course, and now I'm going to be the next lucky person to get to do so on such a proper machine. And the Manx Grand Prix naturally means a lot to you. Double winner a few years ago as well, now competing in the classic superbikes. Part of the platform for you to continue moving on to, to bigger things in the TT and beyond. So what does the Manx Grand Prix mean to you personally? It's been a massive thing for me, my well, all my family really. Um, my dad first did it and then my brother did it. He was in the Tommy Club um, in 2017. Then I come along and I got in the Tommy Club in 2019. I won the Junior and Senior Manx Grand Prix. And we kind of went there because I did it as like under the radar, just built myself up slowly didn't put pressure on myself and my dad basically said to me you're not doing the TT until you do 120 at the Manx Grand Prix then you're comfortable and you can progress up slowly so that's what we did I did two years at the Manx Grand Prix and then obviously it was my first TT in 2022 um, after Covid and I got a top 10 in my first senior TT and lapped at over 128 mile an hour so it was natural progression and um, 
the Manx Grand Prix has been a, a massive part of, like you say, my whole family's racing career. Um, and I'm glad that I can support it this year and I'll do everything I can to promote it. Do you have any particular objectives in mind for Manx Grand Prix this year or nothing at this point? Obviously, I'm a racer. I, I always want to win. Uh, last year, I was second and got the fastest lap of the race. We'll see how it comes. We'll build up slowly, build up throughout the week, just like we did last year, and then see where we are and see what we can do with that beautiful RC45. Meanwhile, for another local competitor, it was his first taste of racing on the mountain course, and it's fair to say he caught the eyes of a few with some impressive displays on his debut this year. Ryan Kringle's solid performances on track during his first TT this year earned him the RST Star of Tomorrow Award. And an exciting opportunity awaits him again, this time at the Manx Grand Prix, as he links up with the Mistral Classic Racing Team. Yeah, obviously, it'll be my first time. I've never been on a classic bike. It's going to be, again, it's another new challenge to me. It's some more laps around the course. It's... it's something I'm going to look forward to and obviously it's going to be my first time there it's the event's 100th anniversary you know, so it's going to be something that's going to be nice to be part of It's the centenary year 100 years of the Manx Grand Prix and one of the big things it's done over many years is provide riders like yourselves with with a platform to you know, continue to develop and maybe look to go on to achieve bigger things in the future so in your mind as someone who is relatively new to the mountain course how important is an event like the Manx Grand Prix? Yeah, it's all just about for me to get some more laps and learn the place. It's um, you know, I we had unreal unreal weather for TT there, but unfortunately we had many of issues with it, so I didn't capitalise on what I could off. But if we have some good weather again, there's another another twenty laps around the place. You know, it's all just a more stepping stones towards TT next year. You know, we're we're still going to be new at the job this time next year at TT, but just take it as it comes and it'll be what it'll be. Joining the Mistral Racing team, we already saw how quick their machines are in the pre-TT Classic over at Balown as well. I mean, how did that conversation come about? Yeah, so I've been lucky enough of um, Paul Phillips. He's, he's helped me from like he, to, to bring me in as a newcomer at the TT. And, you know, I've kept in touch since then. And he's, I just said, you know, if you hear of anything, come come about for me. And he just gave me a text one day. I think we've got something sorted in the pipeline. And um, he came back like a week later of what it was and I was like yeah I'll definitely ride that no problem and uh, passed me Ian's number and we gave Ian a shout and he's yeah everything's just in line to go now just wait they're turning up in the, um, the arm get get comfy on the bike and then get ready to set off on Sunday and in terms of objectives or ambitions do you have any specifics in mind for MGP or are you keeping it quite open are you just focusing on just getting more miles out on the course nah same again same as TT you know I'm, I, I've only done I think it was roughly around 40 laps on the TT I'm, I'm going into this event as a newcomer as well in my eyes you know it is going to be what it is and you know if the bike goes well we could end up with another 20 laps under our belt if we have problems we could be you know sat watching the race you just don't know what's going to happen there's any laps better than no laps but i think come race day it'll be it'll be good and if, if we feel good we'll, we'll do what we can but there's no um there's no pressure from anywhere to do well you made your tt debut this year and i know that the machines and the setup is different between tt and manx grand prix but for you just developing as a rider and working within a team what are the biggest lessons you learned i guess from tt tricky one really because at tt i've always worked with the guys i've worked with and you know they're they're all great bunch of lads so all my favours him. I'm normally quite a hands-on person with a bike as well, but TT, I'd done my best to stay away from the paddock and just, I literally turned up and I'm, um, literally turned up when the roads were due to short and jumped on my bike, you know, everything was done, but um, again, this is going to be a new challenge, new people, just have to see how it goes with them, really. Well, from a rider at the very start of his mountain course career to one who's learned and grasped the ins and outs of it for over four decades. As well as continuing to compete, Dave madsen Migdal provides important knowledge and advice for competitors, having seen the Manx Grand Prix change over the years. So as someone who began his first MGP experience on the course in 1981, how important does he think it is for rider development and also the Isle of Man's heritage? You know, Manx fantastic way of coming, you know, to start. It's no point in coming to the T. It does take you three years to learn the circuit. Yes, you can come. If you're a certain standard of rider, if you're top BSB boy or running the top 20 and you do your homework, you're going to be quick. But you're you're good to start with. Normal people, not I'm not saying everybody, but uh, it it takes thirty seven miles is a long way to learn. It's a different riding style and everything. So it does take a long time to learn the circuit and everything. You you've had many starts and many finishes in both TT and uh, and Manx Grand Prix over the years. Do you get quite a lot of younger or just more inexperienced riders coming to the likes of you for maybe for a bit of advice? I do. I, I'm one of the coaches for the for the Manx Grand Prix. But I've, I've looked after, since I've been living over here, I've looked after a lot of newcomers and they've done fairly well. I've had well, three or four winners as well in newcomer races at the Manx. It's a great way of learning to do the Manx. 
everything's a little bit pointless coming straight to the TT unless you've got the budget to come. The Manx, you can come on a reasonable budget. You've got to have done the six meetings before you can get your course license. There is a big step just to get here. Um, but the Manx is the best way of starting, I think. 2023 marking 100 years of the event and just in general, just how important is it? Not just to, I suppose, racing fans, but the, the Isle of Man and the part of its heritage and culture as a whole. I think it's, it's really important you know, to keep everything going. It's, it's very hard because we're, we are an island and the, with the population is increasing with the houses. and that. So, so that, to actually run the event, it's getting more difficult. Um, but we need the holidays traffic and the people coming to the island but you know it, it's the hundred years it does need celebrated it's like most things um it's tradition and you, you need to keep the tradition and uh, you know just to keep life as it life in the isle of man is manx radio sport well we've now heard from some of the riders but what are the thoughts of those off the track from last year the manx grand prix underwent some significant changes most notably a shift to a more condensed nine-day schedule from the previous two-week format well that shorter program which drew criticism from some corners in 2022 will be in place again this year with organizers having previously stated the move is aimed at securing the long-term future of the event but what do the fans think this time around well to hear that side of things i spoke this week with Alan Brew, who is the chairman of the MGP Supporters Club. Yeah, I mean, the new format um, was uh, was okay. Disappointing for a lot of people. Purists for the Manx Grand Prix, you know, they've always been used to a two-week format. So going to a 10-day format, which uh, which it was last year, was, was disappointing. Resulted in a loss of one or two races that we've had previously. So from that point of view... It was disappointing. The event actually did go quite well. We were lucky with the weather, which is obviously a factor when you reduce the format down to 10 days. And it's the same for this year, which again, from a personal point of view, that is disappointing. They've brought in um, a couple of new classes. They've expanded what was the lightweight class, the ultra lightweights coming back in as well. So what do you make of that, the fact that it's being opened out more this year? Yeah, I mean, that that's a positive uh, move, definitely. Um, the lightweight race last year was didn't have many entries or many finishes, so that was uh, disappointing for the fans. So to open up the event to include more uh, entries is good. The, the change last year from previous years was that the pure MGP race called the lightweight was open to um, TT riders as well. So that was a major change last year and that's going to be the same again this year. The organisers of the Manx Motorcycle Club insist that this is not the last year of the Manx Grand Prix and that this new format is ensuring the longevity of it for the future. Where do you see it? Yeah, I mean, um, I, d- I definitely see a future for the MGP and for the TT. Both events bring a lot of people to the island, so the uh, the income that that brings to the island is, is beneficial. So why would we want to lose one or two of those events? You know, it doesn't make sense. The formats, uh, I think, can be reviewed and looked at and improved on for for next year, possibly. The hope from last year was that uh, this year's event, being the centennial, possibly may be open back up to two weeks, but that hasn't happened. What we have now, going into Manx Grand Prix 2023, what would you and the fans class as a successful and a good year for the event? I think, obviously, from from a point of view of the supporters' club, uh, we want everybody to have a safe and enjoyable ride, uh, no accidents, and hopefully the weather plays ball and we have uh, every race going ahead and are scheduled. Well, no one can deny it's a long and arduous task behind the scenes to make sure the Manx Grand Prix is able to run both smoothly and safely each year. And the vast majority of that responsibility falls to the Manx Motorcycle Club. So how have preparations been going and what do the organisers make of some of the scepticism around the races? Well, here's chair of the Manx Motorcycle Club, John McBride. Really well, actually. It's uh, quite surprising how everything falls into place. Um, our partners, ACU Events, have taken a lot of uh, the load from the club, actually, on the race organisation so we can concentrate more on uh, on our own centenary. And I've got to say that uh, Anne Kinvig, who retired as our race secretary last year, took has taken the lead on that and uh, she's been doing a s- superb job. So uh, it's looking good. Once again, it's like the change that we saw last year in 2022. It is a one-week event as opposed to in the past it's been two weeks. Yeah. So what's the feeling that you've heard about from maybe say riders teams or spectators about 
maintaining this one-week schedule. Are they happy with it? I'm not happy with it personally, really, but I mean, I'd like to see it extended. But it does work for the competitors because it's, uh, that's one of the big things, and it does work for, uh, for visitors. It, it doesn't suit everybody, and I'm not uh, suggesting uh, that it does. But it's, a lot of the ill feeling which there was last year seems to have subsided. A lot of people actually saw the event and when they thought about it, it, it went quite well, you know, and, and they, uh, they realised the, uh, uh, the benefits of having it over, over that period of time. So we've not heard so much this year, to be fair, as, as we did last year, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll keep my ears open, that's all I can say. Some people, plenty, are very, very happy each year to see the Manx Grand Prix returning, look forward to coming to see it, but you see some of the things that people say that they're wondering that maybe our spectator numbers dying out for the Manx Grand Prix. What would you say to that? I would say no. I mean, the um, last year was very, very good. As I say, I mean, I think the um, spectator numbers last year were 13,000, which is its second best year ever at the end of uh, COVID and with a, uh, you know, with a revised schedule and everything. So there's around 13,000 visitors to the island in that time. So I think it's you know, it's it's definitely on the up, and I think this year we should be even better. The fact that it is a one-week schedule, you know, how much wiggle room do you have as organisers to try and get the most out of things if there are delays? Well, Gary Thompson uh, is responsible for that, and he is quite happy that there's enough enough wiggle room. I mean, Sunday is a um, a wet weather day if if anything should should happen, and of course Tuesday this year, which we didn't have last year, we can extend the the uh, the racing to Tuesday. So he's quite happy that we do have enough room to uh, to fit everything in i know i asked you this uh, after the event uh, last year and you were absolutely categorical in your answer so i'll ask you again people were wondering is 2022 or 2023 the last manx grand prix no no absolutely not no we're, we're absolutely committed to the manx grand prix running for the, the only thing that will ever stop it is going to be insurance or or public opinion you know if people uh, don't want it anymore sufficient people it, it, it would probably come under a bit of a bit of an attack there but at this point overwhelmingly the um, the manx public want the manx grand prix well that's all we have time for tonight on friday sport preview many thanks to my guests throughout this week and all that remains is to let you know that if you want to follow all the latest news race schedules and road closure details and more on the manx grand prix from the 20th to the 28th of august please do head on over to our dedicated motorsport page which is at motorsport.manxradio. Com. All the details throughout Manx Grand Prix will be there for you. Well, have yourself a wonderful Friday evening, and whether you're on island already or travelling over in the next few days, we wish you a safe and enjoyable 2023 Manx Grand Prix. But from me, until next time, it's bye for now. Manx Radio Sport.